those miracles he performed through Moses. And God likened Israel's apostasy to whoredom. In Jeremiah 2, 19 through 22, it says, Your evil will chastise you, and your apostasy will reprove you. Know and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God. The fear of me is not in you, declares the Lord God of hosts. For long ago I broke your yoke and burst your bonds, but you said, I will not serve. Yes, on every high hill and under every green tree you bowed down like a whore. Yet I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? Though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Lord your God. I can only imagine that it's like a, a parent who, you know, raises their kids in the best environment. They, they raise their children to be fearful of God and to respect family, and, and they raise them in a perfect environment, and then the child, for whatever reason, gets hooked on drugs and starts doing all, ends up, you know, it's unexplainable. You can't explain it. And and God looks at us and says, Saint, how can you do this? I set all this up for you. I promised you all of these blessings, and yet you still turn away from me. And as we saw above, there's a definite link between apostasy, adultery, and idolatry. There are severe consequences for the apostate as well. So those leaders that draw a nation astray are not getting away with anything. And the same holds true with leaders in the church. You don't, you don't get anything past God, that's for sure. Let's look at King Saul, first king of Israel. Uh, he was a man that was chosen by God to be the king of that Israel so desperately wanted. In 1 Samuel 9, 2, it says, And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward he was taller than any of the people. Now, by all rights, Saul had a reason to be proud or full of himself. You know, he was Great looking, he was tall, big, you know, big strapping, young, good looking guy. Yet, in the beginning, he was humble. We look at uh, 1 Samuel 9, 21. It says, And Saul answered and said, I, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? Saul hid himself when Samuel was looking for the man who would be king over Israel. Um, and I think I, I meant to put the English Standard Version in here, but I ended up with the King James, so I need to fix that. But it says, When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken, and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. And when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should not yet come there. And the Lord answered, Behold, he has hid himself among the stuff. And, he, and they ran and fetched him. And uh, when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. And Samuel said to all the people, See him who the Lord has chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And the people shouted and said, God save the king. Now Samuel started out, I mean, uh, sh that should say Saul. That's an error. Let me fix that while I'm here. Saul started out humble and obedient to God. However, it wasn't long before he forgot where his power originated. And he disregarded the will of God and did as he willed instead of as God willed. And this is very common amongst, you know, people that are given power. In 1 Samuel 13, 5 through 14, And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sand on the seashore in the multitude. They came up and encamped at Michmash at, to the east of beth -Aben. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard-pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in uh, cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords uh, of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel didn't come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, Bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, 
Behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him and greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself, offering the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept uh, what the Lord commanded you. Now, it wasn't lawful for Saul to give a burnt offering to God. That was reserved for the priesthood. Samuel had told Saul to wait seven days, but Saul lacked faith and as a result broke the commandment of the living God. Now it may seem a small thing, it may seem a small thing, but the end result was the loss of the kingdom for Saul and his descendants. God tore the kingdom out of his line of descendants. And in the end, he and his son Jonathan lost their lives. And the lesson here, brethren, is that God will not tolerate the breaking of his commandments forever. He will allow for a period of time mankind to do what they will. But in the end, they'll go the same way that the rest of everybody else who wants to uh, um, disregard what God says. Let's look at King David. Now, King David, the son of Jesse, was a man after God's own heart. We see that in 1 Samuel 13, 14, where it says, But now, uh, Saul, your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Now, David committed much sin in spite of the fact that he loved God and his commandments. He was a violent man and had much blood on his hands. And we're all familiar with the story of Uriah the Hittite, who was the husband of Bathsheba. So let's, let's go through that story just as a refresher. Um, starting in 2 Samuel 11, 2 through 27, it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sat, sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam? the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing, and how the people were doing, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all of the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab, and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. I can only imagine what David is thinking. You know, here he's done this horrible thing to such a loyal servant and a man of such principle. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next, and David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank, so that he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his lord, but he did not go down to his house. And in the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah, <laughs> sent it by his own hand. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him, that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew where 